going to read those motifs, we're going to get bag of words or list of words from ConceptNet, where we want to get objective features of the society, or when we want to get psychological dispositions, we will use different uh, psychological dictionaries, the LUC and the MFD. Then the motif either will have this word or not, zero, one. I'm going to be basically counting how many motifs talk about earthquakes in a given oral tradition, talk about the king, talk about anger. Uh, and then I will do a bunch of things with ethnographic atlas. And at the end, I'll say, look, um, some of these, I, I'll attach these dispositions to the identity of the responding world value surveys and show some correlations. Again, nothing goes out, of course. It would be a pity to even mention this. OK, so is, first thing, is the physical environment reflecting the oral tradition of society? <sighs> Again, it's, it's always been fun talking to you. Uh, in the sense that he's very dismissive of, of the knowledge set of, non, of economists. And he's just like, like I, so at some point I was talking to him on Skype and said, the first thing that I will do, I will correlate your measures of uh, motifs with physical things of the environment that you can observe. <laughs> it's like, it's, I'm really like, dealing here with the dummy, but okay, stay. Let me actually tell you how, you how it would be better to think. You seem to have the idea that groups are like on native, uh, are like uh, plants that grew up in a given place and uh, they were always rooted there. But if you read a bit carefully the history, all groups is an outcome of historical migrations. So, if this is true, which I guess it's true, it is, it is true that the historical migrations that bring eventually a given ethnicity language in a given place, folklore is a depository of this basically history. It's not only what you observe in a given environment that will be immediately reflected. They say, yeah, it may be, but you have a lot of history that you've gone through many different regions that, you know, it will reflect the landscape of the migration history of the group perhaps better than the current landscape. And I said, oh, no, Yuri, you may be entirely right, but if I basically show a data set at which basically people talk about the desert, but they live in a rainforest, that's it. No one will ever take this seriously. I said, that's your problem. That's it. <laughs> you know, it is. <laughs> so, okay, fine. Now, what na makes me better than Yuri is that I know stuff. <laughs> so, so I could actually go and say, you know, we can test, do a simple test of means with various features that we can observe. Okay, so what is going to be basically what I'm going to show you is like log of uh, counting motifs of a specific concept, and uh, I'm going to be comparing groups within the same country, and I'm going to basically be do, draw a buffer around each group of, let's say, 30 kilometers in this case, and I'm going to be measure geographic characteristics in this buffer and, and uh, <coughs> do what they have to do. I will be controlling for the number of motifs in the oral tradition always, the word length per motif. It is automatically can generate more motifs, more tagging. Uh, the number of authors in the group and how many dummies you have. Dummies in the sense published before 1900, between 1900 and 1950, just to get some uh, idea of the sampling. Okay, so here's the earthquake thing. Let me just show you the correlation. The centroid of the group is like, this is in thousands of kilometers from basically a high uh, five and above earth trembling zone. If the further away you are from a, an earthquake zone, the less likely you are to talk about um, earthquake motifs. How about thunder? Here we get for every community, again, or a tradition group around its territory, above 30 kilometers. In, we don't have historical data on lightning, so we have data on between 1980 and 2000, how often it strikes during uh, you know, an, this annual freak, mean annual frequency. Well, if you live in places that flashes more often uh, during the night, you need to explain it. We would have more uh, stories about the origin of thunders. Um, <coughs> cold in the oral tradition, you don't look for insect in concept net, you look for cold in concept net. Um, places that are actually colder, you, look m you talk more about cold events. If you are in warmer places, 20 Celsius and above, you don't have instances of cold. So this is what, what I'm getting there is basically a story that an abundance of a given feature, a relative abundance of a given geographic feature, maps into basically an increase in the mention of this feature in, in, in the oral tradition. Some are obvious, but 
it is the first time that someone does this analysis statistically in the corpus, so it is kind of news. Obvious news, but news in the sense Yuri is not 100% correct. <laughs> no, that's, that's correct. That's correct. <laughs> he is not 100% correct. He may be 95% correct. And this 5% is what I get here. Uh, because again, the R squares are not big. There is another 60% that cannot explain why we talk about the cold. Uh, so again, let's be honest here. I'm just getting some pulse. I'm not getting to explain 100% of the variation. Right. Although it'd be interesting because you could, you could try to take him seriously and say, Okay, where was this group yeah. before using linguistic or genetic yeah. data? Correct. And then you use the T minus one to predict and see if you can get some more. Yeah. Correct. So you can do a, a, a complicated uh, spatial T minus one and a given idea of like, okay, now what is the clo what is the path hmm. that explains that maximizes the R square of really talking about earthquakes a lot, given that today you are in a low earthquake environment and see whether. Uh, Yes, you could. That is actually that is super exciting. I don't know how to do it, but, <laughs> but it sounds you know, possible. It sounds, <laughs> yeah. In this physical world, there is always uh, someone who, who right. knows much more than you, and you hope that you will bump into him and be generous to share with you his insights. Do we know, Max. So, do we know anything about these migration patterns before? Let's say the ethnographic atlas was recorded. Yeah. So, I mean, there's lots of efforts to reconstruct that using archaeological linguistic and But for specific. Yeah, for specific groups, specific expansion. Oh, so they yes. the idea that the Bantus expanded out of the Congo, Congo Niger when they went in certain directions at certain times. These are archaeological data to date. Right. Yes. Yes. Oh. So you could train this and now run it for many more groups for which there is not would not really know where they come from. Right. So you could take a group, say, in southern Africa, and at least there there's a general sense, you know, where they came from, you go north for a while and then you have mm -hmm. to go uh, west. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And then disappearing with the fact that you know broadly that it came from this bandwidth of like several thousand kilometers, but now given that you observe the geographical features very distinct, which is the path that basically makes these geographic features be so much prevalent <coughs> given where it is today. Um. <laughs> Next project. No, you would be excited with that. Like, so I told you. Like, <laughs> but, uh, uh, okay. Um, I mean, there's just a lot of literature that takes sort of weather or whatnot and throw, throws it against the ethnographic atlas and doesn't account for migration mm. before at the ethnographic atlas. So it's like Correct. It seems like a big contribution if, if, if that really worked out. Uh, <coughs> it would really change the way we think about groups in economics. Mm -hmm. Because then we really take seriously this migration history, these interactions, and not where you are right now, but where you came from. and. Well, that's why the anthropologists get so bent out of shape about controlling for language biology. Mm -hmm. They want you to remove that historical mm -hmm. okay. What we do here, because we are agreeing with, we have clustering at the language group level, and sometimes we can even exploit variation within the language group level. Not all the correlations go through, but the healthy share survives. Um, but we do have kind of fixed effects very often. So the comparison we do is within Namibia, the different groups that we, whose oral tradition we observe is their meaningful variation. Okay, so fine, finally what I want to tell you, look, if you have better farming environment as of pre-1500, you are more likely to have motifs on crops. The way we talk about crops is that we have the top three uh, crops worldwide with rice and corn from ConceptNet, and I tag motifs accordingly. Now I'm going to make my, so the first part will say look, geographic characteristics do seem to reflect some observable reaction in the narratives regarding the presence of these geographic features. Let's now have ethnographers meet our folklorists, you in particular, and see whether they can communicate, whether uh, the stories that are, are heavy on agriculture, are really about farming groups in the ethnographic record, are heavy on hunting, are these really hunting groups in the ethnographic record, and so on and so forth. So, uh, that's fishing motifs, that's the distribution, <coughs> that's the distribution, the share of fishing motifs. So, uh, we get in various parts. What I want to show you, that's hunting motifs. Um, 
I was much hunting in Europe, lot of hunting in this part of the, in the, um, Middle Africa. Okay, so here is basically uh, some conditional correlations. Dependent variable is the share of subsistence that comes from the given activity, farming, animal husband, fishing, and hunting. And here is basically the number of motifs that are about agriculture, about pastoralism, about fish, and about hunting. Uh, they come with the, expected with the expected signs. Cultures that are heavy on uh, pastoralism, they are going to have many stories, many pastoral motifs, um, and also some stories about hunting. Uh, similarly, hunters, they will talk a lot about hunting stuff. They will not have motifs on, on agriculture. This again is like smell tests that tell you that there's something there. And you know, th these are the scatter plots. They're pretty decent scatter plots. Uh, these are bin scatter plots about the relationship of uh, X and Y. So this is on hunting and gathering, this is animal husbandry and hunting and uh, pastoral motifs. Okay. Now, how about centralized societies? This is now what we can basically, how often do you mention king and related terms, terms related to king? In concept net, the word that you will tag is king, queen, ruler, prince, princess, reign. Um, societies in the demographic atlas that are organized as states have on average four such motifs, whereas a kephalus, stateless ones, have just one motif. It's like the, 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 the test of means is very different. And that's a relationship. You are going to talk more about kings, motifs more about kings when you are a more state centralized society. So here's the first use of this of this folklore data. Um, now, the fact is that there are several entries in the ethnographic atlas for which they are missing entries. This one of the cases is the degree of centralization. So for the degree of centralization, we have 90% observations that are there and 10% for groups for which we have no idea. So what we can do basically, we can just do a prediction out of sample and basically uncover, if we believe within sample that we have captured some meaningful variation, we can see out of sample what type of groups do they have this missing information. So. This is what we do. This is the missing guys. The missing guys are actually about two. Two is in the basically middle range between, uh, z uh, you know, those that are stateless versus those. So these are the predicted values from folklore, the degree of, degree of centralization. <coughs> so this is now low centralization predicted. That's your actual on average. So there's this linear nice relationship. This is for the missing guys. Now, you can also ask, what's the distribution of these guys? Like, on average, how are they? At the beginning, I was always thinking that the missing guys must be very remote guys, that they never kind of managed to reach, so they would be kind of like mostly acephalous and mostly, uh, you know, kind of stateless guys. Well, it is not the case. Ah, I don't have it. If you plot the distribution of these missing guys compared to all the rest, they are slightly shifted to the right. So if anything, on average, missing societies are of slightly higher level of hierarchy than those that are documented. I talked to Jamie Robinson about this, and he says, look, you have to think of the incentives of people doing PhD thesis and going back in time and going into these communities. There was a premium on sampling those that are on the extreme stateless spectrum that you know you really you made a sign to the community that you went in out of the beaten path to map and sample these communities. So middle of the road communities, they would not be so interesting to sample. Um, and that's, that's the way that he's rationalizing why we're finding this slightly shift to the right of groups that are n have missing uh, character, missing uh, centralization. And that's true. OK, so um, now one thing that we don't know, again, maybe, from the ethnographic atlas is the degree of trade. And you know, as economists, we have been making many stories about the market economy in, in, in history, but we don't really know much of it outside Europe and, and Asia. So the way that we thought of it, I thought of it, is basically maybe we can just look at how many stories you talk about that there are about trade. Uh, so let's just punch in trade from ConceptNet and figure out how many, uh, uh, how many motifs you get. So that's what we get. Now, if you force yourself a bit to find a pattern, what you would find <laughs> is the secret. So then if we they said, oh, maybe that's interesting. Maybe then, if we were to get data on a trade routes back in time, 
digitize some old maps. We can cross validate whether what folklore says is actually relevant because you were close to trade routes. Naturally, you would basically absorb more stories or you would develop more stories about trade. And that's what we did. We got, there was a different project on basically trade routes before like 680 or even uh, or like more later ones, like 1700, and that's what you get. The further away you are from trade routes, the less likely you are to have motifs on trade. Now you can ask the question, is it really the trade routes of the recent, of 1700 AD, or these like the more ancient trade routes that are, seem to have left an imprint on, the, on, on what you talk about? It seems to be that the older trade routes are more informative. But even like if I were to put the 1700, you know, it's, it's just less precisely estimated, but suggests that probably trade-related stuff or narratives is not about the recent developments of the 17th century, 18th century that you incorporate in your stories. It's some older exposure to, to trade economy that, uh, that seems to survive in your narratives as of the 19th century. Okay, done with uh, done. You know, some, 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 spend a lot of time telling you that there is some cross validation there on geography. Now, I'm just going to pick two hypotheses and show you what we can now do with this cross validation. Not cross validation, it's like now starting to use folklore to ask questions that we could not have asked in absence of Yuri's work. So, say that, oh, and here is a who. Oh, Diver diversion. Uh, uh, okay. Now, when you enter a world that you would like to show a correlation between a given thing, let's say, hunter gatherers talk about X, and you would like to test it. Well, the problem is that hunter gatherers may talk about many, many more things, including X. So the issue is, how can you now convince yourself that you really have found the true association between X and hunting and gathering lifestyle if you don't have random variation in these elements. So how can you make sure that there are no other correlated concepts that are correlated both with X and with what is the lifestyle of the hunter gatherer? Okay, so now in a world that we would like to uh, define what is the potential pool of the concepts that you're talking about. You may be talking about thousands of concepts at the same time, but you want to test one given concept. So we're going to follow, uh, so here's a, so the Yuk dictionary has many different con concepts, processes, they talk about them. So it's about uh, social psychologists. So here are some of the concepts, uh, social processes, cognitive processes, perceptual processes, drives, time orientation, relativity, MFD, Moral Foundations uh, Dictionary has fewer bugs, care, harm, fairness, cheating, loyalty, betrayal, and things like that. Now, this is in the Luke Dictionary, these are the old different <coughs> concepts that you can think about. Anger, uh, sadness, anxiety, family, friends, uh, 50 of those uh, things. Now, the issue is, if you show a correlation between hunting and gathering and say leisure, how are you sure that this is actually hunter gatherers talk about leisure and not about many other concepts at the same time that are correlated both with hunting and gathering and leisure? So, um, how to do this? We do not know what's the right set of controls. There are many. You can control for everything, but that's, that's, that's a world where it's, it's, you will lose any identification. We're going to take a, advantage of recent developments in estimating structural parameters in linear, sparse, high dimensional, high dimensional. Uh, models with many controls. Basically, it's a post double selection methodology that was suggested by Belloni and Kothos, Chernozhukov, down the road in MIT. The idea basically is to use lasso over all potential concepts on your variable of interest. This is hunting and gathering, and lasso over your concept of interest, leisure in this case. So what is the idea? The idea is intuitively simple. You want basically to have a first stage where you say, when you see many motifs about leisure, what are other bugs that appear very often? Do they talk about anger? Do they talk about work? Do they talk about partial them out? Because you really care about leisure without these occurrences of other bug of words. Do the same with hunter hunters. When what, is the what are the different concepts that they talk about? 
partial them out as well. And so now, in the second stage, the correlation between only leisure, your concept, and the mode of subsistence, Hannigan gathered. So that's the intuition, basically. Um, OK, now, why I'm thinking about leisures and ha leisure and hunter gatherers? This is not a hypothesis I would like to test. Savins, 1972, it's a conference. I don't know where, but it's a, apparently a famous conference. Basically, he presents in the conference that, look, we have been getting entirely wrong. Hunter gatherers actually have an abundance of leisure. He used basically um, from three, four societies in, in, uh, in East Africa, he had time use data about how much time they would actually do either hunting or, 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 or gathering. So then you would put the numbers down. And on average, they would work for about three hours a day. So say, like, compared to where we are right now, it was like in the industrial uh, regime of we work about 10 hours a day. Farmers work about seven hours a day. Clearly, we've been going down. Uh, evolutionarily speaking, we have been working harder and harder since you know, starting on hunting and gathering. It's a little lot of debate. Uh, you know, so, okay, so how can we shed light in this debate? Well, we're going to talk about, you know, how many motifs you have about leisure. Okay, so that's, you know, if leisure is, in, is important and abundant, maybe you talk, you know, you have many images of these uh, leisure-related activities. So, if you tag leisure in this Luke dictionary, you're going to get things like celebrate, dance, entertain, dream, fun, game, joke, sing, play, relax. So and events, motifs, that have this kind of, of main um, themes. And here is some motifs. Person joins dancers, but then understands that these are trees and rings moved by the wind. A uh, person plays throwing his eyes or his tooth up or away. Um, and th funny things happen with his eyes and his tooth. Well, what we get is that basically hunting and gathering groups are much more likely to have motifs on leisure. This is across countries. This is now within countries. This is doing the post-double selection thing that we basically control at the same time for all other potential bag of words and concepts from this Luke dictionary. So it appears to be a robust correlation. OK. Now, you can say, look, I have never read silence. And can I have no. Can you just go back to that for a second? There was one thing I didn't. So you have 1,200 and 3,700 gathering groups? Ethnographic? No, this is 0, 01. Oh. Whether you're, you are a predominantly hunting and gathering group, yeah. so I'm comparing you to the other modes of, uh, of, subs yeah. of subsistence. OK, so uh, say that you have no interest in silence or in other, other famous hypotheses. What you could do? You can just basically uh, say, look, what are the features, the elements in the social diction in the dictionary that you have that are more correlated with your given mode that you want to understand? In this case, hunting and gathering. So if you were to do, uh, there are many ways that you can do it. There's a wild west of basically machine learning techniques, lasso, reeds, random forest, and many others. Now, if you do lasso and ask the question agnostically, tell me what type of motifs, concepts are most salient in the culture of hunter gatherers, they would heavily load on leisure. This is what I just found earlier. You would not talk about home. You would not talk about money. You would not talk about religion. So these are kind of like, again, in an agnostic manner, if you don't want to, to basically uh, say, look, I have a specific hypothesis test. Running out of time, I want to talk about the last bit of not, not exchange, not plow. Although plow is fun, but not. Uh, OK, so. We do not really know, we do not really know. There is a debate about whether we should be thinking about cultural institutions in the sense, are they complements or are they substitutes? You can have theoretical models that predict uh, stronger, uh, you know, stronger states to crowd in better behavior, culturally speaking, or to crowd out better behavior. There are two papers out there, empirical papers, that they arrive at opposite conclusions. One paper by Nan and Robinson and uh, Sara and Montero. They look at descendants of the Cuba kingdom versus the, which was a centralized group, versus descendants of other less centralized groups. And they find that descendants of those that belong to centralized groups, they are less likely to abide by rules today. They are more likely to cheat. 
hinting towards the substitutability between strength of culture and strength of, 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 of state capacity in the past. There's another paper by Dell that does the same comparison somewhere in Vietnam between two historical again, entities, one that is centralized and the other that is not, finding that in the place that was historically centralized, there's much more obedience, there's much more crowding in of respect and good characteristics. So this is it's telling that different pairs of comparisons can deliver you different answers. Here I'm going to tell you, well, if you were to look, ask this question from the point of view of folklore and say, I don't have, of course, anything about causality, but I'll just tell you what is a broad correlation in the data. People in, like, state groups in the past which were more likely to be states, what do we observe in their oral tradition? Are we more or less likely to think, to push, have motifs about obedience, about um, respect for authority, uh, and, uh, and things like that? So what we actually find, we're looking at authority uh, from the Moral Foundations Dictionary, which underlines virtues of leadership and followership, including deference to legitimate authority and respect for traditions. This is what the MFT guys think that they have put together when they, can, they have created this word list. So now if we run it over our, uh, over our uh, motifs, we find, we find clear, robust correlation that places where more centralized groups, um, groups with more central, with history of centralized statehood, the narratives that they have are espousing more often respect for tradition and respect for authority. So it's like a, a crowding in uh, story. Now, I'm out of time, so I'm just going to tell you why do we ma care about this? What do we care in the sense from the contemporary point of view? We, I care a lot about all these things that I have shown you, but for today, if you say, look, I'd you know, why would I bother about oral traditions? What do they mean for today's behavior? Well, take my guys, my oral traditions, tag them, the respondents of the World Value Surveys today. Here's a bunch of questions, for example, uh, in the World Value Surveys, that are about how justifiably you find rule breaking. And because they were very interested in this concept, there's actually four or five questions about collecting unlawfully government benefits, not paying transportation fare, accepting a bribe, and there are a couple of more others. So these are now respondents giving their how justifiable they find these different uh, actions. Well, if you trace your origin to a group whose oral tradition has many more motifs about respect to authority, you are much less likely to basically find justifiable to do what? To claim unlawfully government benefits to avoid the transportation fare, to accept a bribe. So again, this kind of gives you an idea that exposure to motifs that are of a certain um, moral foundation, that is respect authority, respect tradition, today these respondents are less likely to find events of law-breaking behavior as justifiable. Uh, the funny thing that these questions are, that they're actually correlating the opposite with the actual macroeconomic indices about bribing, let's say, or, or corruption. So societies uh, in the world value survey say it's really bad to accept bribes, although those societies which actually have a huge corruption problem. Right, so, so this is now, you can, this is now, that's at the, at the group level, you can do the same thing at the individual level. So you can add con under fixed effects, religious denomination fixed effects, male, female, occupation fixed effects, and get variation of respondents within the same country, they face the same level of corruption, but they have different, uh, again, attitudes towards it. So I'm not saying what, what you're saying is not <coughs> true, I'm saying that this is not what is driving this correlation, because we can look within countries as well. Uh, one last thing that I didn't tell you, that I, I thought I had updated in my presentation analogously, is that about leisure. So I spend a lot of time on leisure. Why? Because in the World Value Surveys, oral traditions, groups that hark back to oral traditions that talk a lot about leisure, they value leisure a lot. Mm -hmm. They have 
they are they answer that they value having a good time is very important in their life and they find nothing wrong with basically not working and this is not the sign of laziness so again these are characteristics that perhaps uh, you know give you an idea that the exposure to different stories that are at when you are growing uh, at, the, at the early stage can shape uh, you know how you view the world down the road and the, the last bit is that I what I would like to do with this project is now this project I think gives us a systematic way to think about how culture is transmitted if we think that folklore is one of the vehicles via which these elements of beliefs and attitudes are passed through generations well we can test it we have the folklore of our ancestral societies we now have the motifs how they appear we can actually go and see what are the, the children's book today consumed in Minnesota consumed in Greece consumed in Turkey what is the correlation between basically the motifs that exist in these ancestral data sets of, of Yuri for example and contemporary content of children's book well we, uh, my conjecture is that in places where you will find the tight correlation in the concepts between the past and today, this is the metric of persistence of intergenerational uh, values and beliefs. And if in places you observe actually that whatever they now consume in children's book is very different from the type of, uh, that was being con produced 100 years ago, it is a, you know, a measure of rapture with your, uh, basically your ancestral uh, Okay, sorry, I took five minutes more. No, that's no problem. Just a quick question. Max, so yes. you started out with the motivation you want sort of to contribute to a database, which is, you know, a second ethnographic effort from, sort of from the past, or a second well value survey just in the past. So, I, text is a noisy measure. Um, how, how much information do I actually get out of this, these text measures for stuff we don't know from the well value survey or, uh, sorry, from the ethnographic effort? I repeat, Max. You are saying that. So I'm interested in the trait X, which is not in the ethnographic analysis, yes. and I want to use that data set because I can measure it from text. Now, text is noisy. How reliable is that measure from mm. the text? Mm. How much do you say I can trust any measure I extract from folklore for missing values in the ethnographic atlas? This is your question. So I, 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 I believe you that there is some information in there, but what's the sort of the signal to noise ratio? Mm. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. I can basically, what I think I, I will be able to tell you, which I haven't done, uh, mm -hmm. we got some, some very nice comments from referees on the first part of the paper, basically to say, look, for the ones, for the places, for the groups, sorry, for the concepts like centralization, for which you have a subset for which you observe the degree of centralization in the ethnographic record, and the subset of groups from which you do not observe. In your predicted, when you predict for the unobserved guys, does your prediction show the same correlation structure with other observables like hunting, gathering, uh, fishing, as in the sample that you have not made the prediction? If so, that's a good sign. Right. It means that you have preserved the properties uh, of the correlation structure of the observed part. Uh, now, for those who have no idea about the photographic atlas, that's what I try to do with the, with the distance to trade routes. Mm -hmm. That one indirect way to test them is the distance to trade routes. For the rest, is more papers that can do much better work than our initial. So, the, be frank here, there are many mistakes in, <coughs> in this effort. B our goal is to basically to bring it, to hopefully make it available very soon, so that people can, can do a much better work than what we're doing and take it to new directions that we have not thought about yet. Max, you said uh, text is noisy. Is, is there like good data on that to show that it is noisy? It doesn't, I, mean, one, you get an, I had that same intuition, but... Um, well, it's, I'm it's, just thinking because the ethnographic data is noisy too. No, so it's yeah, not it's obvious at a first pass that the, that the stories are going to be worse than you know some ethnographer who washed up in the village. Yeah, so you, yeah, you know much better about the ethnographic. I just know about text. And okay. Uh, <laughs> text is noisy, yeah, so okay. it's just a nature. So we need like a third measure, like a benchmark both. Yeah. Right, so I guess the geography part is kind of, uh, if you, uh, I haven't done it, but that would be one way to go. If you think that geography is measured with the least error, say, and you think that you have the very good data on the ethnographic record on how much they do pastoralism, 
<laughs> you, your method, for example, on the suitability of pastoralism, does it correlate strongly with the motifs on pastoralism or with the actual dependence on pastoralism? Yeah, yeah. This can give you a first idea. If it is stronger with the ethnographic record, then it's where in Max's world, where basically text is much more noisy than the observed ethnographic yeah. record. If we are in Joe's world, we have basically a... Yeah, that's a good idea. So that, that's actually a bunch of kind of those variables and see... To see how... Yeah, how yeah. Right, the differential correlations and make... And of course it could be differential, right? For, for some issues, the ethnographic record would be super detailed. And in others, like the King's one, I'm pretty sure that... The, because it's a very coarse measure, the way that they have measured the centralization from zero to four. Whereas with the uh, hunting and gathering, they are much more detailed. You go from zero to ten, so they are more gradient. So uh, the story can differ uh, by by the topic that you are curious about. Great. Well, thanks a lot. That was really nice. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. We're going to go to the Grafton now, or at four, or four o'clock meeting. Yeah. We're meeting.